Uh, so just briefly, for those who don't know uh, what ResApp does, uh, we're developing the world's first uh, smartphone device or smartphone app for diagnosing respiratory disease. Uh, we don't require any additional hardware and that's really the key to our value proposition. We're a piece of software that sits on a phone uh, that listens to audio, either cough sounds or breathing sounds or snoring sounds as we move forward uh, and is able to make an accurate diagnosis, a clinically accurate diagnosis from those sounds. Uh, we're targeting what is a huge global market, uh, 700 million plus doctor visits every year that result in a diagnosis of respiratory disease. And we've been really focused on delivering the clinical evidence to take this forward. Uh, and going forward, you know, we're well funded to execute on that clinical strategy. Uh, I'll talk mostly today about our respiratory, acute respiratory diagnosis uh, results, uh, but I'll also talk a little bit about our recent results in obstructive sleep apnea. Um, those were results were released uh, last week and we're very excited about that opportunity as well. So just briefly talking about respiratory disease, respiratory disease is the most common reason for you to go and visit a doctor, um, typically at a GP level or an emergency department or an urgent care facility. Uh, it's everything from the simple common, common cold, such an upper respiratory tract infection, uh, to diseases such as pneumonia, asthma, uh, bronchiolitis, croup in children. Um, and then chronic diseases such as asthma and COPD, which need to be managed day in, day out. What's really um, exciting about this opportunity for us is that you know, today this is diagnosed really with a suite of tests, everything from a stethoscope to imaging to blood tests to sputum tests. Uh, and all of those results of those tests are put together in the, in the doctor's mind to come up with a diagnosis. Uh, so these tests are time consuming. They take a significant amount of time, days in the case of some blood tests. Um, they're expensive. Chest X-ray in the US costs around $300 per shot. Um, they're subjective. It's a, it's a decision, a clinical decision made by the clinician. Uh, and in the end, not very accurate. Uh, clinical diagnosis or X-ray diagnosis of pneumonia is only around about 70% accurate uh, today. And so you can see there's a, a big opportunity to come up with something that solves these problems. So our technology was licensed from the University of Queensland. It's based on machine learning technology uh, that listens to cough sounds to make a diagnosis. Uh, so we look for signatures inside those cough sounds and match those signatures to disease. You can think of it a little bit like Shazam. So Shazam listens to music, finds a signature in music and matches you to an artist and title. Uh, here, what we're doing is diagnosing disease by listening for a signature in your cough. Uh, we use the built-in microphone, so we simply hold the phone about an arm's length away from the patient. Um, the, the recording or the app then li listens for coughs, ignores other noises and only acquires coughs. Cough five times, answer a few questions about your age, your um, gender, and we pro provide an instantaneous diagnosis then and there on the phone. Uh, we don't have a cloud server or anything like that. It's all done on the phone directly. So we've been focused on the last two and a half years on developing the clinical evidence needed to take this forward. Uh, we've been, we were initially doing result, doing studies in Indonesia with the University of Queensland. And we diagnosed pneumonia at greater than 90% accuracy there. Uh, about two and a half years ago when we listed on the ASX, we kicked off a clinical study at two major pediatric hospitals in Perth. Uh, and since that date, we've re recruited over a thousand pediatric patients and shown diagnosis accuracy of around about 90% for the whole suite of respiratory diseases you see in children. So everything from croup to asthma to bronchiolitis to pneumonia, all at 90% accuracy. Compare that to what I said earlier, which was that a chest X-ray for pneumonia is only about 70% accurate. Uh, so we have a tool that is clinically accurate or, or accurate enough for clinical use for diagnosing these diseases. Uh, we're also building strong evidence in adults uh, we've enrolled, again, roughly 1,300 patients in clinical studies in Perth and Brisbane. Uh, we've diagnosed community-acquired pneumonia, acute asthma exacerbations uh, in the emergency department, and we've also been diagnosing chronic diseases such as COPD and chronic asthma uh, in the lung function test lab, where there is a, a very um, gold standard diagnosis for us to compare to. Uh, so we're very excited about the opportunity for the platform moving into these chronic diseases um, as well. So how do we get this to market? Well, we've always been focused on providing a tool for telehealth. Uh, so in telehealth, which is basically you seeing your doctor with a, over a video consultation, uh, Skype call as you, as you wish, 
Um, we see a big opportunity there. US telehealth is already very large and it's growing rapidly. Uh, a couple of years ago, Deloitte showed that there were about 75 million telehealth consultations um, in the US and it was growing at over 50%. So we can imagine that number is well north of 100 million today. Um, telehealth consultations, about 30 to 50% of those are for respiratory disease. And the big issue in respiratory disease is there's, that a doctor cannot use a stethoscope during that consultation. Um, so they don't really have the ability to form an accurate diagnosis during that telehealth session. So they have to send you in for um, using a stethoscope or send you in for a chest X-ray, blood tests, etc. Uh, so we provide that opportunity for those telehealth uh, clinicians to make an accurate diagnosis during that telehealth session and get the patient better basically straight away. Uh, so and our initial focus for telehealth was in the US, uh, but we've now seen significant growth in telehealth in Europe as well as Australia, uh, as well as in the Asia Pac region. Uh, so I'll just give one example is Ping An. Ping An is a large Chinese insurer, obviously have a large health insurance business. They have also just recently spun out their Good Doctor service, which is a telehealth service. Uh, so they're listing on the Hong Kong Exchange and as part of their perspective, they disclosed the number of consultations they do per day. And so they disclosed that in the last year they did 370,000 consultations average per day uh, and that's grown by more than 100% from the year before. Uh, so we see a significantly large opportunity for us uh, in China uh, as well as the rest of Europe, Australia and the rest of Asia. So moving Towards the market, telehealth is obviously our first um, uh, first attack angle here. Uh, so we are looking at partnering with telehealth providers and providing a tool for those telehealth doctors to make an accurate diagnosis. Our business model, our revenue model is to charge five to $10 per test. Uh, so every time our test is used, we get paid. Uh, and that sits well with the telehealth current business model, which is about a 40 to $60 charge per telehealth consultation. So our five to $10 per test layers on top of that 40 to $50 or 40 to $60 charge. Uh, we've also had significant interest about being used in an emergency department or an urgent care clinic, uh, basically where time is of the essence. Uh, so if you've got a test that can be done bedside, it can be done very quickly, um, then we've got that, that opportunity. Uh, so again, we're looking at a per test fee. And again, we're looking at five to $10 per test. In both of these cases, I want you to compare a little against that chest X-ray, which is $300 per test. Uh, and that chest X-ray is only for pneumonia. It doesn't tell you about the other diseases as well. Uh, we're also working in the developing world um, to arm aid workers uh, where we provide them the ability to diagnose respiratory disease uh, in the village setting. Uh, so as of the end of last year or the middle of last year, we ran a US clinical study that was a failure. Um, our top line analysis showed that the endpoints were not met in this study. Uh, and we went back and looked at those results and really um, took a deep dive into those results and worked out that it was not the technology or the algorithms that failed in that study. Uh, what actually failed was the study execution. Uh, so we found a number of issues. Patients were being treated before the cough recording was made. Uh, so essentially the patient was better uh, by the time that we got to test them. Uh, we found that patients were uh, recorded with a significant amount of background noise. So for example, a television was on uh, for during the recording and that television was on actually very loudly to try to settle the child um, in that location. So there are a significant number of problems where the study was performed or the recording was performed outside of what we'd intended. Um, we also finally found a fairly large material variation in clinical diagnosis between sites and even over time. So in some sites, you'd be, they'd be diagnosing asthma um, while in other sites they would be diagnosing just an upper respiratory tract infection because the patient was no longer having an asthma exacerbation. Uh, and so these issues uh, we identified fairly quickly and have worked very, very diligently to solve in our next follow-on study. So fortunately we had the ability to repeat the, the clinical study. We were very fortunate to have the three clinical sites, Mass General Hospital and Cleveland Clinic and Texas Children's all willing to help us rerun the study. Um, we're again targeting that same number of patients, similar number of patients, same sites, uh, but we have some significant upgrades to how the, how the study is run. 
Uh, the, one of the main upgrades that we see that's having a major impact on the quality of the recordings and increasing the quality uh, is actually bringing some of the training and some of the checklists up front into the app itself. Uh, and so we have a checklist as shown on this screen, which the nurses have to use every single time they record a patient. Uh, and so that tells them to, th to do things like switch the television off, avoid loud treatment, record only the patient coughs, uh, and then it also gives them a measure of the background noise uh, and they're told not to go forward if that background noise meter is in the red. Uh, and so this is uh, making a very large difference to the quality of the recordings uh, for the good. We're getting significantly better recordings out of this study. Uh, we also have centralised independent clinical adjudication. So all patient records are sent to a centralised independent group for clinical adjudication. Uh, so we have a set of doctors based in Boston uh, who are not connected with MGH, they're not connected with Cleveland, uh, who assess every patient and form the clinical diagnosis. So as of the 9th of March, we had 640 patients recruited, uh, which is more than we saw in, in the previous year's um, study. And so we're well on track to complete that study in the middle of this year. Uh, we're also performing a significant amount of quality assurance. Uh, we have two levels of quality assurance in this study. The first level is that at each site, there is an independent quality assessment team who review every single audio um, recording and make sure that it is uh, recorded within the protocol. And then a selection of those recordings are also sent directly back to us uh, here in Brisbane, and we are able to review those. Uh, and I'm pleased to say at this stage, you know, all of those quality assurance processes are working very well, uh, and we're seeing very high quality audio coming from the study. Uh, so we've also broadened our paediatric study here in Australia uh, with, the, with that study to read out in the middle of this year. Uh, and will provide results that we can take for European and TGA approvals. I started by saying that we, we started the technology as, a, as a, um, a single point where we're looking at respiratory disease in children. We've moved into adults, we've moved into chronic disease, uh, and just last week we announced some results for obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, and these are really exciting results that really demonstrate the power of the platform to quantify what's going on inside the respiratory tract using the sound coming out of your mouth. Uh, so sleep apnea is the most common sleep breathing disorder. Uh, and what's exciting for us as a commercial opportunity is that it's significantly underdiagnosed. Uh, so more than three in 10 men and nearly two in 10 women uh, suffer from sleep apnea, uh, but 80% of those are not diagnosed. And that's really our target market here. Uh, untreated sleep apnea obviously leads to tiredness. Uh, it leads to an increased risk of car accidents, um, but it also has been linked to things like heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. Uh, so there is a significant health risk uh, associated with untreated sleep apnea. The major barrier to being diagnosed with sleep apnea is really um, that you are only diagnosed today within a sleep laboratory or in a home sleep test. Uh, these require specialist equipment. In the case of a polysonography sleep test, it requires 22 cables connected to your body. Uh, while you try to sleep in an unfamiliar situation in a hospital bed. Uh, they require a referral, they require long wait times, uh, and they cost up to $5,000 per test. Uh, so it's a significant barrier for people to be tested uh, with sleep apnea. Home sleep testing lowers that barrier a little bit, uh, but there's a number of issues other than the cost being also expensive, there's a large failure rate there. So up to 18% of those home sleep tests fail, due to basically the patient not doing it correctly, not putting the nasal prongs in their nose in the right location, not putting the ECGs on correctly. Uh, and so we see a significant opportunity to simplify that whole process by using a smartphone on the bedside table. And so you can see in the bottom corner here, that's all we require. Smartphone sitting on a bedside table and recording the overnight sounds. Uh, so it's an easy to use device. You press go, when you go to sleep, you wake up the next morning and it has the result. There's no cables, it doesn't affect how you're sleeping at all. It's only software, so you know, our pricing model is really flexible um, to, to how we want to take this forward. We use audio signals, obviously, as before, looking at breathing and snoring sounds, both signatures and patterns, and are able to diagnose sleep apnea at a roughly 86% sensitivity and 83% specificity. So we believe this, these are accurate enough for us to launch a product at home screening of sleep apnea. Uh, we're pushing forward with a prospective study with 
our, with plans to submit for regulatory approval by the end of this calendar year. This study is really simple for us to, to run. Essentially, we place a smartphone next to a sleep laboratory study. So very low cost and very um, effective at recruiting patients. Doesn't happen more in the winter versus summer because that's what we get in our acute diagnosis. It's 10 beds at a sleep lab that is 100% utilized at all times. So it's very easy for us to enroll patients. So just a summary, I mean, we've talked about this technology now for two and a half years. It is revolutionary. There's nothing else out there like it. Uh, and we're really starting to demonstrate that it's a platform uh, for diagnosing all sorts of diseases using sound. Um, we have really three key milestones moving forward. Uh, the first is the Australian Perspective Study, which we expect results this half of this year, so in this quarter. Uh, our US study, uh, we expect results in the middle of this year, and that study is recruiting well and we're getting high quality audio. And then finally, the Sleep Apnea Project. Um, we expect to continually update the market on that as we push forward with perspective testing, uh, potentially algorithm improvements, uh, and then regulatory submission by the end of this year. Uh, so we're really excited about the next six months for ResApp um, and you know, welcome any questions.